Welcome to The Big Break Show, a podcast where we discuss short-term rentals, entrepreneurship, life, mindset, and everything in between. Here are your hosts, Rafaloza and Jesse Vasquez. What's up, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of The Big Break Show. I am here with the man, Mr. Jesse Vasquez. What's up, dude? What's going on, man? Do you know what episode we're on today? Probably you do know because I just freaking told you. So uh, you didn't. You just told any... me right before we started, bro. <laughs> we're on episode 31. <laughs> if I was to ask you before that, would you have known it's number 31? No, I, I would have been like, where, uh, where are we, Jesse? What episode are we on? <laughs> I know. Luckily, I write everything down, you guys, in my trusty notebook. And yeah, episode 31 today, we have actually one of Rafa's buddies, uh, Sean Ackerman, who actually we met on Clubhouse a long time ago. And this dude's doing some really cool stuff in the Midwestern states, in Milwaukee specifically. Um, he's a New York guy, born and bred, and is investing in real estate in the Milwaukee area. And this guy owns a ton. I didn't realize he had as many properties as he has, Rafa. Yeah, dude. I mean, look, Sean's awesome. When I when I first met him, like we connected right away. Energy's amazing. Uh, Personality is amazing. Super helpful. Always comes with the with a like spirit of helping, right? Helping other people do bigger things, better things, greater things. And um, I knew he was doing big things in Milwaukee. He's the guy that I bought the property of in Milwaukee, right? The one that I talk about on the show quite often, yeah. my very first actual investment property out there. Right. And he hooked me up with the fat deal and he does very, very good creative financing. So, you know, the fact that he gets properties super cheap, super low cost and very, very creatively, it wouldn't make sense that he has a lot of properties because he has quite a bit. I think he says 70 something doors in Milwaukee, which yeah. is... Like 74 or something. Yeah, 74 doors in Milwaukee. Nuts. Um, and we talk about some of the prices that he bought stuff for. You know, Rafa and I being in California, Sean being in, in New York, no reason why he's buying in freaking Milwaukee in the Midwestern states. I mean, he's picking stuff up for less than 100 grand. I mean, things that he bought 15, 20 years ago uh, for 24,000, you know, like, I mean, dude, it's crazy. That's why real estate is such a, you know, it's a long term game. I and mean, he bought stuff in, for 24 grand. Now, today, it's what worth, I didn't even look at that, but. It's probably 10x already, you know, what he bought it for. I don't know about 10x, but definitely got up there. Well, you know, in this episode, we talk about two strategies, active income and passive income. And this dude set up so good for both. I mean, his passive income portfolio is probably wrecking in some serious, serious good cash flow. You know, and the the, the term passive means that in 20 years from now, he's going to be doing even better. Like he's going to be racking it in real nice. Right. And he uses the act, the active income portfolio to fund the p passive income portfolio, which is gold. You know, I hope everybody really enjoys this episode. It, it, re it really is probably like one of my top favorite episodes because his energy is awesome. And like, it was just a really fun conversation to have. The dude's just great. So without further ado, I really hope you guys enjoy it. Leave us a comment if you do um, and share it with someone else because he gives some seriously good information here for you guys to get started in the world of real estate investing. So hope you all enjoy it. John, what's up, brother, man? Thanks for coming on. I've been excited. It's been a long time coming. How are you? Hey, man, I'm awesome, man. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Rafa. Jesse, man, you guys are awesome. I'm so happy to be here, brother. Happy to have yeah, you, Yeah, dude, thanks for coming on. So uh, before we get going, I have a bunch of questions. I want the uh, listeners and the viewers to know who you are, what you do, what you're about. Um, tell them everything about you, right, from your backstory and then uh, where we're at today and what, it's, it, what it is that you actually do right now. Cool, cool, cool. So um, listen, man, just like... Every other inner city kid growing up in New York City. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, uh, born and raised in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, you know, a part of the crack epidemic, man, unfortunately, of the 80s. I'm an 80s baby, just made it. You know, I'm like that 80, uh, 1980 and six months guy. You know what I mean? I'm that guy. You see all the grades. You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, yeah, man, I grew up. That's that's. You know, that that was what molded me, you know what I mean? Um, growing up, you know, it was rough, you know what I mean? The, there was no one in the family that could kind of guide you into entrepreneurship or, you know, none of that sort of stuff, man. So I didn't grow up with that. Um, we grew up hard, but, you know, uh, it, it was all worth it, you know what I mean? Um, so grew up, later transitioned into the workforce, you know, nine to five, you know, the typical go to school, got a four year degree uh, from the City University of New York. 
and psychology of all disciplines. Um, absolutely no use uh, to me today. Um, but uh, got my four year degree, you know, uh, met my wife. Um, we bought a house. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's that's kind of, you know, me in a nutshell, man. Um, and then after that, you know, we start talking about children and stuff like that. The next stage. And that's when the birth of my ideas uh, about investing, uh, you know, kind of came to fruition. OK. And how did how did you actually get started in your? Well, OK, so first I, the backstory, right, you, how you came up with the idea to get into investing. But what made you get into real estate investing, I guess, is the, the question. And and before we we answer that. Tell, yeah, tell everybody what it is that you do within real estate as well. Gotcha. So first and foremost, our company, I Kept It Real Estate, is a New York-based company. Uh, we're based in Long Island, New York. Um, essentially, what we do, we have a few different arms of, of the company, I would say. We have a wholesaling uh, real estate arm. We have an education arm. And we have a buy and hold arm. So we do it all virtually. Like our office is here in Long Island, but 95% of our business is done in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, 700 miles away from here in New York. So that's really what we do um, in a nutshell. How I got there though, man, it's, it's, it's beyond me. I think about it, uh, you know, from time to time, it's just like, how the hell the cheese state of all places, but it was really about cash flow, uh, Rafa. That that was that's really in a nutshell. That's what got me to Milwaukee, man. From all the different markets um, I looked at all around the country, cash flow, bro. That's that's what got me there. <laughs> so you know, it's funny. Uh, yeah, the, the the we were talking about that, right? Why in Milwaukee when you're in New York? <laughs> So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, it's the reason you're the reason why I'm in Milwaukee, right? Because we ended up doing a deal and I got that house out there, that duplex. So I'm excited to see how that goes. But aside from the the you doing everything from New York, like, can you talk a little bit about how you do it remotely and all virtually? You know, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how that works. Absolutely. So, you know, what? very early on, man, I was taking trips down to Milwaukee. Um, this was like 20... 14, 2015, man, when I decided that this is pretty much going to be the market for me because it checked all of the boxes. Like we, I had a set of metrics that I applied to different markets all over the country. And Milwaukee really just checked all of the boxes uh, for me. Um, but I, I took a lot of trips down there, man. For the first 18 months, there was no investing in that market. It was building out the network, building out the infrastructure, you know, seeing how things would work. Who did I need to have in place at different points um, in the business, right? Um, so that's really how it started, man. Flying out there, I would fly from LaGuardia Airport into uh, O'Hare in Chicago and just drive into Milwaukee, a Friday to Sunday. And I would do that every quarter. I did that every quarter for, uh, for 18 months. And just net, just networking, taking people out to lunch, breakfast, dinner, whatever I needed to do to get, you know, the, the team in place, um, you know, and I can kind of go into the team if you like. But that's really what I did for 18 months straight, man. Yeah, I got I got a question for you, man, because a lot of times people are asking, like, you know, how do I grow my network? What does my network actually mean? Like, wh who is the network? So can you kind of break that down right now? Because, I mean, people go to real estate meetups and stuff like that. But when you're actually building a business, you need to be boots on the ground talking specifically to these individuals that are going to help you in that sense. So break that down, what that actually looks like for those that are listening right now that are curious about that. Without a doubt, man, without a doubt. Well, f for me, um, obviously, you needed a place to close your real estate deals, right? Um, so title company was was very important for me early on, right? Um, here in New York, you're required to have an attorney to close a real estate transaction. But in Wisconsin, which is one of the metrics, um, you know, it's, it's a bit of the Wild West, man. I'm not going to lie to you. As long as you have a contract, signed contract and a uh, title company, you can close a deal. So title company, super, super important for me. Um, the realtor, um, super, super important to me because in Wisconsin, typically brokers, do property management, right? 
that's like the double edged sword, if you will. So you you get with a nice property management company. They're also a brokerage, right? So if you need to get deals from them, if you need to offload deals, you have that at your disposal. Plus the management component. Um, you know, at some point, every uh, buy and hold, long term hold, is you're going to have an eviction, right? So I needed a process server, right? Who's going to do the evictions for us? We needed contractors, right? Um, handymen, electricians, you know, uh, plumbers, runners, you know, everything, man. So really, those 18 months I spent traveling back and forth, it was really just meeting those people. Um, telling them what I wanted to do in the market, how passionate I was about, you know, uh, coming in and making a difference in this market, bringing these houses that were in very, very bad shape up to snuff, you know, to rentable co- condition. Um, and it was that was that was the network, man. That was the networking. You know what I mean? Um, I didn't go to a ton of meetups in Milwaukee, but I would cold call in advance of my trip. And then everyone that's that was on my list, whether it's title company, management, whoever, I would take them out to dinner and uh, just have a conversation with them, similar to what we're doing today, man. Yeah, you know it's really important. I think everybody listening to right now, and you might be able to back this up, Sean. Uh, uh, Sean right, Sean. There you go, Sean. I just want to make sure I got your name right. Yeah. So the- you can call me anything, man. <laughs> just don't call me late for dinner, bro. All right, just don't call me. Late for dinner. <laughs> I got you. I didn't know. If I, I almost called you Shane, but you're Sean. So, you know, you brought something up, man. It's a lot of times people don't realize like title companies and even loan originators, they like to deal with people that they know in their same state and their same, literally in the same city too. And you can actually lose a ton of deals by not connecting with people in those markets. A lot of times a realtor that you're working with, say you're out of, out of state and you have a loan originator that's in, I'm in California and say you're in New York and they're, they're not dealing with those local people. They won't choose you if you're buying something on the MLS because they don't know who that company is. They don't know how, how they work. They have a hard time getting a hold of the right, you know, the the right people. Um, so talk about that for a second. You know why that's important to make sure that you connect with those people. Absolutely. And you know what, Jesse? It's funny you you bring that up because I actually almost well, no, nah, not almost. I actually lost out on funding from a lender because I was from New York, and obviously the property is in Wisconsin. So you know, um, how it worked was. I just I found a bunch of different lenders that I was looking at uh, putting some hard money on. Right. Some short term financing before we did the long term financing. And I called this one lender and she said, you know what, Sean, my husband and I, we would love to do it. But unfortunately, you know, we don't lend to out of state investors. Now, I tell you a trick. and, And the reason why flying back and forth to Wisconsin, to Milwaukee for those 18 months made a difference, because turns out. This hard money lender is friends with the owner of the title company, right? That I do business with, that I've been bringing all of my business with. And she said, oh, because I told the title company, hey, you know what? I'm having difficulty finding um, some hard money after I bought the property in cash. She said, hey, let me reach out to my buddy. Reached out to her. It turns out it's the same person, man. And she said, Sean, you know what? If it hadn't been for this relationship you have with Merit Title, you know, I, we wouldn't do it because we just don't lend to out-of-state investors. So network, right? Persistence, right? Um, and just doing right by people, man. That comes around full circle, man. And I just, you know, had to share that story because that's something that actually happened in our business, man. I love, I love what you said, doing right by people. How many people out there are always out just trying to look after themselves and be like, well, you know, it doesn't matter what happened to this person. I say that all the time, right, Jesse, right? If you take care of enough people, like it always comes back and pays you back tenfold. Always, man. Always. I love that you said that. I appreciate you saying that. Um, Sean, really quick, I I, want to touch on because we've touched uh, like quite a bit of information, but we haven't really actually said what it is that you actually do. (laughs) Right. I don't do nothing. Right? We're like, I sit at home and collect rent checks. There it is. There it is, folks. No, no more need to talk. That episode's yeah. over. That's, that's what he does. That's the beauty of this, right? Got right. you. No, no, and I mean like because I know you're like, yeah, yeah. No, I want you to talk about because for, for the listeners and like I know what you do, right? Because like we've done a deal together. I've talked to you forever. Um, yes. And so it's like I want people to know your direct-to-seller side, your long-term buy-and-hold side, your wholesaling side because it's not – Hey, you're a real estate investor, sure, but you know anybody can. You can go out and buy a house and be a real estate investor. But there's very unique strategies, and one of your strategies is extremely unique, which is 
what I want you to touch on. So if you, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So uh, I understood that when I chose the market, I was going to build my portfolio in a very integral part of that building process was me having the ability to affect the growth right, of the portfolio. Because otherwise, I'll be reliant only on the MLS, only on be other people bringing deals to me, stuff like that. right? So I said, no, that's not the route I'm going to take. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start a separate business right, that finds real estate deals. Right. So that's a separate component. And we actually buy from our wholesaling company. Right. But essentially what it is, is it's a marketing, you know, going direct to sell. As you mentioned uh, earlier, you know, we have two VAs um, from one from Dhaka, Bangladesh and one from Croatia or I don't know, bro, one of those countries out there. But all they do is make phone calls all day long and shoot out text messages, right? So we have a, a separate business. We have an acquisition manager for that business. We have the two VAs and we have a transaction coordinator. Someone that once we have it under contract, they coordinate with the buyer, they coordinate with the seller and the title company. So this is a separate, separate entity, right? So essentially how it works is we pull lists, right, from a, a service called PropStream. Right. I'm sure many of your listeners have heard about that um, way to find motivated sellers. Right. So we typically target um, we're targeting now pre foreclosures, but you can target tired landlords, out of state investors, you know, people behind in their taxes, recently divorced, stuff like that. Right. So we target them with direct mail. We target them with phone calls and we target them with text messages all day long, day in and day out. That's its own business, right? Um, so the VAs are constantly on the phone talking to sellers. And once we get a motivated seller, then we have to qualify the deal and undo the underwriting of the deal. So we'll send our contractor out to say, hey, listen, the property needs X amount of work and repairs. We take the value. We shave off the equity about 35%. Well, right now it's really about 20 or 25% because the market is so tight. Then we shave off the repairs, shave off our assignment fee, because we still, whether we keep it or not, we still build in an assignment fee. Right now, it's anywhere from seven to $12,000. And we make the seller an offer, right? So if the seller is truly motivated and has a reason to sell, they're in some sort of distress, then we put the property under contract. What we've been doing lately, Rafa, I'm going to be honest with you, is targeting a lot more sellers who have mortgages and then buying the property subject to the existing mortgage. So we've been using a lot of creative financing to make our offers as of late. But essentially, that's what we do. That's how we go direct to seller. And when we get a deal locked up, we have two options. We could either keep it for our portfolio Again, growing the portfolio, or we could sell it for active income, right? So it's really its own business, right? So, you know, that's why I love going direct to seller. That's why I love um, building out that branch of the company because there's really no limit. Like we would limit ourselves and how much we can grow, right? Because we're not reliant on any other institution or structure to buy real estate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Did that kind of uh, help with the going direct to sell a piece, Rafa? Yeah, dude, that was awesome. That was actually great. Like really, really good information. I, I, I have a ton of questions. So, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Number one. Okay. So you have a separate entity that does a direct to selling and then you have your entity that does the buy and hold. And when you get a deal through your direct to seller entity, you can either wholesale it to someone else with that assignment fee, or you wholesale it to your own buy and hold entity. And then you decide to hold it in your portfolio for passive income long-term. That's it. That's the play. Dude, that's awesome. And I, I, so I had a question in between the explanation where you said you bring in a contractor. Do you bring in a contractor to go look at the repairs prior to making that, um, that offer? Or do you Ask the sell, uh, ask the sellers like, hey, what's wrong with the property, and get an estimate that way. Right. So, <laughs> so with I, I like to say I'm from the show me state, right? From Missouri, even even though I'm a New Yorker, but you know, sellers will tell you whatever they want to tell you, right? 
um, because they have a need to sell the property. So that's still a part of our script, right? We, you know, when the VAs reach out to the sellers, we ask the sellers, hey, is there any issues with roofing, foundation, plumbing, electrical? Are there any tax issues, any mortgage issues, anything that would prevent the sale of the property? So that's still a part of our script. But trust but verify, man. You know, before we give the seller a number, we have to send our contractor through to verify the repairs. Because the last thing we want is to buy a property, then have to go way beyond budget because we didn't foresee a roof, a foundation, a plumbing, and electrical repairs, which we know those things can, you know, be extensive, you know, uh, over time. So, we absolutely, we never make offers on a property unless our contractor, who we've been working with over the last 10 years, has gone through the property and verified the repairs, 100%. I love it. Okay. When you have the contractor come in, you get all that verified, you make the offer. How, how do you work it out when something does arise? Like, let's say you're trying to wholesale the deal to somebody and like, let's say an unforeseen issue, like the pipes were you know, rotted and roots are going through it. And now the piping has to get redone. How do you, do you go back to whoever you're wholesaling it to and work a different number out? Or do you go back to the seller and lower the rate? How does, how does that situation work? So if, if there's something that comes up, like buying in Milwaukee in the winter months, pretty is very, very tricky, right? Because God forbid the electric goes out in a property, the furnaces require, unless it's forced air, they need to be on the electrical system, right? So if that goes out, then there goes the heat, right? So what we would do in that situation is we'll, we will have to go back to the seller, depending on the size of the repair, right? Because if we have a $30,000 assignment fee built in and it's a $5,000 repair, we may just eat that $5,000 cost, right? Just because we have the deal locked up, we don't want to stress the seller out. We don't want to add 5K to the end buyer because we've already come up with the number. It really depends on the repair. We've eaten a lot of those sort of things just because we don't want to rock the boat. And the relationship to us is bigger than going back and trying to get an additional seven, 10 grand out of a seller or a buyer, right? But if let's say we have a $10,000 spread and it's a $8,000 repair, I mean, you know, something's got to give a little bit. So it really depends on the situation. But um, we, we try our best to eat as much as we can. But, you know, we have a business to run. So we, we can't we, we have to just kind of weigh it depending on what the issue is. You know what I mean? So, uh, Sean, I want you to explain what's the second part of the strategy that you said you're currently doing right now, which is subject to a lot of people out there don't know what that means. And if you can explain to that, explain that for them, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, in Wisconsin, which is probably true all across the country, right? There are people that take out mortgages, then life happens, right? Um, Where they get behind. Uh, on their mortgages, right? And they can't make the monthly payments. The last person we worked with, uh, what I'm trying to think of what her situation was, she moved out, she moved out of state, then she let her niece take over the property. The niece was supposed to send her rent every month um, in Texas, and she wasn't, and she didn't have the money to make the payments, right? So uh, essentially what happens when people fall behind, we do a couple of different things, right? We still have to evaluate the deal because we evaluate whether it has a mortgage on a property or not. We evaluate the property from an equity standpoint and from a cash flow standpoint. Um, Sometimes we buy stuff that is underwater, right? But it's going to make tremendous upside on the cash flow. So if we invest 20 grand, it will be out. You know, we'll have our money back in 18 months or something like that. But the strategy is, is simply buying property with an existing mortgage on the property, right? Where we are basically going, stepping in for the seller and making the payments. Now, these mortgages are not assumable, right? So there's a difference between taking over a mortgage and assuming a mortgage with the bank's permission. Most of the time, the bank doesn't even know what is going on. And we have to keep it that way because these mortgage clauses sp- specifically stipulate that this mortgage is not transferable to another person. 
So what we do is we get them to create a login uh, for their mortgage account. We go in, we uh, attach our bank account, we set it on auto pay, and then we pay it. But prior to closing on the transaction, we have to look at how far they're behind, you know, what's the amount Then we have to reinstate the mortgage um, and then close, officially close on the property. But subject to it's been a tremendous strategy, especially for single families, um, because we're able to get into properties for 10, 15,000 that are worth 120, 130,000. And we only have to reinstate maybe an eight or ten thousand dollar mortgage. Right. So it gives us the ability to control a piece of property, then add a uh, rent to own tenant uh, in the property. Right. So these properties, typically, we don't have regular tenants in them. We put a rent to own uh, tenant in these properties. So we buy it creatively and then we sell it on the back end with a rent to own tenant. I know that's a lot, bro. <laughs> no, that was great. I was at, my my question was going to be what's the exit strategy behind it like how do you get out of because my first question was how do you protect yourself from that person coming back and saying well I still own the property with the bank because they're still the ones on the on the actual mortgage bank account loan Correct. and yeah. then how do you get out of that to be able to get that money back out and you kind of explained the the backside right so go ahead can you touch on that for a second right so uh, all of our subject to deals we take title to the property. There's no, we don't do any land contracts this way just because of the risk. Um, we don't do any quick claim deeds. We go through the title company. We actually have a closing on the property where we're now on title. Um, our name will show up on the uh, public record, the assessor's website. Officially, we own the property. They own the debt, right? You know, so it's really from a, from a risk perspective, um, the only risk is was well, two two factors. Um, one, the lender calling the note due. You know, but if you un understand a little bit about this, how this country works, lenders are really only concerned about getting their money right and making their interest. So as long as you don't interrupt that, then I think you have a pretty good chance of riding the wave or riding the mortgage out. As far as sellers coming back, I mean they can try, but if title has changed, they've kind of relinquished their authority, if you will. Yes, they still have the debt, which is attached to the property, but title, I mean, I'm the active owner on title. You know what I mean? So good luck trying to take the property back from me when I'm, you know, the current owner. You know what I mean? That's crazy. I didn't know that was a thing. That's a thing. Definitely a thing. <laughs> yeah. Talk about creative. Don't do, don't do no homeboy in the parking lot deals. No <laughs> side alley deals. Everything officially has to go through the title company. One thousand percent, man. One thousand percent. Okay. When you put the the um, rent to own tenant in there, how do you structure that deal? Do you mind talking about that? <laughs> man, these deals are so sweet, Rafa. I mean, they don't compete with your short term rental. Cash flow, they can't compete with that. But for long-term tenancy, man, these... I'll, I'll say this. I have some of these uh, deals where the rent-to-own tenant will end up buying the property twice, right? So let's say I sell it to them for 90000 At the end of the term, they or three times, they would have given me $180K easily, right? And I'm going to tell you how I structure it, right? Very, very simple. So with rent to own, you get paid a few different ways, right? And Which is one of the reasons why I like the strategy because it's ultra passive. I don't have property management on these deals. Uh, the owner in training, which is my rent to own tenant, they take care of the property inside and out. Um, only thing that I pay is taxes and insurance, right? So roof, foundation, plumbing, electrical, that's all on them. Um, but the way I structure it is I usually like to go seven years, seven to 10 years, right? Um, so I go seven to 10 years and a little bit above market rent is where I go. And the other thing I do is get a non-refundable deposit up front from them, right? So for example, let's, let's look at one of the deals we have right now. Um, I bought the property for 135000 The seller had a $118,000 mortgage on the property, I gave them 12500 right, um, at closing, plus, you know, so, some other fees and stuff like that. I rent the property for 1583 a month. 
their mortgage is eight forty three per month, right? Which includes taxes and insurance, right? So the mortgage, taxes, and insurance about eight forty three. I get paid fifteen eighty three. It's probably like a what six hundred dollar difference ballpark, seven hundred something like that. So really, I'm looking at the money that I'm yielding. Again, no responsibility for maintaining the property, no utilities, no nothing. I'm really just looking at how much did I put out up front versus um, how much cash flow or how much of return on the difference that I'm making on that money. And from my calculation, I think I was out in the probably like the beginning of the second year. You know what I mean? So I'll have I'll be into it for no money and still have about six and a half years left to just keep on recouping capital, man. Hey, Sean, when you pick these up, are these places like roach infested? Are they like beat up? I mean, when you, you're you not picking up mansions, are you? Or like, tell us tell us what those look like, because I've heard people that subject to like these big badass houses sometimes. Yeah, man, I'll be honest with you. It, it ranges, man. Um, but I'll give you I'll give you an address, man. You can look at it yourself online. Right, Twenty three oh two. Yeah. Twenty three oh two West Center Street or Center Avenue. Right. This was a duplex converted into a sick, uh, a single family. It's like seven bedrooms, four bathrooms what city? in this place. Um, Milwaukee, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Gotcha. 2302 West Center uh, Avenue or Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Got gotcha. you. Okay. Awesome stone exterior, double porches. Amazing. It, I mean, it had a baby grand piano in it when I bought it. I only put down twelve five for this property. No way. And it pays me fifteen eighty three uh, a month, and I just have to pay the mortgage of eight forty three. And I bought that. You can probably pull it up when I bought it um, a year ago or whatever. I'm looking. But at that's it. it. Twenty in twenty twenty. Yeah, it's a big old corner lot. Big old property on the corner. Right now. Five bedroom, Let's six thousand two hundred four. That, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, you bought it in. Uh, so the five beds, it's really like eight beds. Yeah, you know, it's, it's John is huge, man. That's crazy. So when you say mansion, right, <laughs> it's funny, but this is a huge property, right? Right. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's and I put a rent to own tenant in there who has a lot a very large family. Dude, why are you not doing freaking short term? Like both of these sides right here, you could probably get your money back in like three months. Twelve. Grand. I got to sign up with Rafa, man. I he he's got to take me as a student, man. You know, I've been begging this guy, Jesse. You know what I mean? He, he he's just too busy for me. What's up, but buddy? I don't really think this is the area uh, for it uh, yeah. anyway, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you'd be surprised yeah. sometimes. Look, yeah, Sean, wait, wait till my my place is up and running. My place is going to be like the actual true tester. We've done the research already. We like the numbers, but let's see how it actually performs. Once it's done, man, we're going to do some good stuff out there. I mean, I've st I've stayed at places that are tr that I, that I've paid. They're in Milwaukee near the downtown area, like the, down in the bar district area, the art district area. And, okay. Um, cool. I paid what like three twenty five a night, you know, for like what? sixteen days. So, but it was you know, and it was a tiny one bed. No, two bed, two bed house. And wow. so wait till till I see how these do. That way we can put something together out there. Cause I know you have a ton of property there that we can convert Definitely. a couple into for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready, man. I'm ready, man. You know what's crazy, Sean? Looking at the prices of this, and this is why you went from New York, you're in New York and you're <laughs> <laughs> Man, man you see it bro when, when you look at these prices you guys i'm looking at the sold price do you mind if i say it out loud is that okay yeah, yeah absolutely okay. all right cool. sold 723 21 for 135,000. you know what i could buy where i live in california for 135,000? dude <laughs> and it's cash for a, what, seven... a panel on a garage yeah dude no you can't even buy the garage bro you can't even buy a garage <laughs> for 135,000. you can't even buy the rv parked in the driveway for 135,000. Yeah, you know, man. let me tell you real quick. I'll buy a, two Vizio boxes together, shaped like a triangle, dude. That's exactly what I'll get for 135 grand <laughs> in California. I kid you not, dude. <laughs> you know, it's. I saw I saw an article that they were charging 800 dollars for a box now to like to live in for the month, and it's a cubicle. Not even it's a. You just fit. It's like a, a twin size box where you go in and you lay into it. Yeah, it's a and coffin. It's, it's only. Yeah, it's like a coffin. It's a four by four. <laughs> What? And it's eight hundred dollars a month in San Francisco now. Like that's where people are living now. You know? Okay, so one hundred thirty-five grand, dude, and your cash flow on what seven fifty, eight hundred dollars a month? 
Yeah, Whoa. but I only on twelve five. Yeah, I know. That's nuts, dude. <laughs> Subject oh, two. Okay, <laughs> let me let me put that into perspective for everybody listening and watching this right now. Okay, uh, twelve thousand five hundred down on a one hundred and thirty five thousand dollar home, a subject two deal where you're cash flowing eight hundred dollars a month. You're gonna be out. You're gonna be your entire money back will be back easily in a, a little bit about two years, a little bit under two years. You own a one hundred thirty five thousand dollar property, cash flowing you eight hundred dollars a month, free and clear. Okay, let me let me still put this into perspective. In California, in order to buy, not granted, not subject to, but in order to buy a property here in California, you're looking at a minimum of about four hundred and fifty thousand if you find a really good deal, minimum, right? With uh, let's say ten percent down, right? You're looking at at least forty five thousand dollars down, not including closing costs, and you're gonna cash flow negative. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's true. For everybody listening, we're just joking about Milwaukee. The market's terrible. Don't go out there. Right? Well, we, don't, we don't want to flood it, Sean. Now everybody's going to be like, dude, we got to go to Milwaukee, bro. Rafa I'm and Sean are in that. Milwaukee. Gosh darn it, dude. That is gold, bro. Yeah, there's a lot of people heading there. Uh, Kansas City, Milwaukee, all those play, all those flyover states in the central, like middle of the Midwest. They, yes. This is what you find, man. A lot of people don't want to go there because first off, just like you said, they don't have boots on the ground. They don't know how to do it. You know, you can read books like long distance investing, stuff like that can kind of give you an insight on how to do that. But um, man, it's great. When I look at these numbers, I get goosebumps because like we're sitting here spending, you know, thousands of dollars to make a grand a month. You know, just like Rafa said, 40 to 60,000 on a, you know, 350 to $450,000 house. But really you could, you could still make that same hundred, uh, you know, 1000 a month by picking something up and and you, you did get a good deal because I'm looking at places around that just sold for there and they're selling for 60, 70,000 over what you paid for it like recently. Really? Well, dude, Sean, it's crazy, right? The deal that you sold me, we I got it for what? 132. I don't even want to know what it's worth. I don't even want to know what it's worth. No, I, I, won't talk, I won't talk about it then. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay, so I talked about it on the show before, right? Nobody knew that it was like, because you you barely came on, but to, for everybody listening, that, that Milwaukee duplex that I got, I got from Sean. And um, he wholesaled it to me for 132, I believe it was, or 135. I don't remember the exact number. But um, yeah, and I got a hard money loan on it, and the ARV is 206. And so I, I'm $24,000 into it in rehab costs, and that's because we're doing high end. Uh, rehab because we're going to convert it into short-term rental. So once I do, once I do the refi, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to pull out a hundred percent of the cash I put into it. Right. Um, cause I'll be in what one, one seventy five or something. And if I do get it at two Oh six, it's probably gonna be a little bit higher than two Oh six because of the finishing Definitely. we're doing on it. Um, Definitely. it's going to be a full bird deal. I'm going to be in it for $0. Hopefully fingers crossed. We'll see how it goes, but it's going to cash flow projections, $3,600 each side, right? Crazy. Each side. Crazy, crazy, so, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, thirty six hundred each side. Oh, that's not. You mean you can't find that in California, Rafa? Are you serious? Not for one hundred thirty five. Well, if I found them in California, <laughs> we would have never. Yeah, we would not be talking about this right now. I'd be out there buying them. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, man. It's nuts. It's nuts. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's, you know what, Sean? I have a question for you right now. Since we're talking about kind of, you know, to kind of shift subject from sub sub two, um, are you seeing way more foreclosures coming up right now? You know what? That's what we're targeting right now. Just because we're based on the marketing we're doing, those are the people that are responding the most. So you know, we're we're constantly looking at our metrics. We meet. Uh, on a biweekly basis, the entire team. And we're like, hey, guys, who, you know, where's the response coming from? Is it direct mail? Is it text message? Is it so we go through all of that? Then we narrow down what ge uh, demographic of people who are responding. And it's people in, in foreclosure, pre foreclosure, and foreclosure. Because once it goes to auction or once the city takes it back, the name transfers on the assessor site, it's a done deal. But we're catching people in, in pre foreclosure. Yeah, that's really our population. Because, you know, like there's a lot of people talking about a lot more foreclosures that are actually happening. I've, I've you know, watched on Instagram a couple of stories, people saying like, oh, a bunch more in foreclosures are happening. So are you actually seeing that happen right now? Like where there's more than there typically was before in the past? You know, what? I can't say if it was more than it was in the past because it wasn't like the major. Our major uh, people were uh, tax delinquent. 
Got you. And tired, tired landlords, right? People that have owned property 30, 40 years. So we have come across some pre foreclosures in the past, but it was never nothing where we're like, we need to target this demographic. So we can't really say if there's more or less, but I can say that is our sweet spot right now uh, in Milwaukee and doing those creative finance uh, type of deals. Got without you. A doubt. Yeah, and you know the creative financing side right now is becoming such like it's all it's becoming a trend. Like there's a lot of younger people that are jumping into it. You know, like the sub two, Pace Morby, all those guys are kind of creating like this like culture behind uh, you know that whole sub two movement. So like what what's the easiest way for somebody to get involved in sub two? And like you know, is that just are those random? Do they just because you guys are calling already people anyway? Do you do those fall on your lap or is it something you're specifically going after or is it kind of just like icing on the cake if you're doing? You know, uh, you're calling to, to get a wholesale deal. Like, what does that actually look like? And how would somebody be able to do that? Right. Those uh, we, we don't set out to do creative off right off the bat. But in our script that we have for the seller, it kind of deduces to that point. Right. Because cash is quick, dirty. We can get it for 60 cent on a dollar. It's a done deal. 65 cent on a dollar. It's a done deal. So that's easy. But typically, our cash offers are going to be lower than what the seller is willing to take. So we've introduced this other component where, hey, listen, we can pay you 80 grand for a property that's worth 100, right? But we have to do that over time, right? So when we make offers to the sellers, we hit them with our low ball cash offer. We hit them with our creative finance offer. And if they like the number, typically they like the higher number. Then we say, hey, here's how we can do it. We can give you a little upfront, right? We'll take possession of the property. We'll take this burden of this mortgage off your plate because that's the issue a lot of times. They can't make the payments. We'll take that. We'll pay the taxes, the insurance. We'll maintain the property. You take this money, go live your life, and we'll make the payments. And we'll let you know when we're going to pay it off. And then you'll have this beautiful mortgage off your name that you Stop paying six to 12 months ago, right? So now you're free of having your credit just completely collapse. But it really starts with us making our offers and our regular script to the sellers. We always tell the seller we make two offers, one cash and one on terms. And then they say, what's terms? That's usually the higher number. And then we get into the whole how we can buy it with the mortgage uh, remaining in place. Got you. Did I answer your question? Just, I'm sorry, man. I feel like I'm just going around in circles. <laughs> I'm good. sorry, man. Did good. I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I know, definitely it did. Yeah. All right. Dude, you're dropping really good info, man. I appreciate it. So, Sean, really quick then. I, I'm still, I, I kind of want to get this, like, wrap my head around it. Sure, let's do when, it. When you do it on terms and you sell it for more money, the more money is the difference that you give up front, or do they actually get more money over time? Like, that's where I'm a bit confused. Like, when you sell the property, do they get more, like, another check? Or is it just the, the seller? Initial? Yeah, the seller. No, just the initial, man. Just unless you you can work that out with them too. What do you do? But once you take title, they're out the way, right? One Got because they, you have you have to understand they're in a distressful situation. They're gonna end up with nothing if the bank takes it back, right? So a hundred percent of nothing you can have, and I've said this to sellers all the time. Listen, you can have a hundred percent of nothing. Or you can take this 12 grand that I'm going to give you and walk away with something and not have a foreclosure on your mortgage. Um, but to answer your question, Rafa, you can give them something up front. You can give them even something in the middle if there's enough meat there for your uh, rent to own tenant and something on the back end. But I'd rather just be done with them up front. All right. Let me give you this 10 grand. You walk away. I get title. I'm already set up my credentials on the uh, the website for the to make the payments. My account is already on auto pay. I'll, I'll talk to you when we actually buy it, close, and then you have the mortgage out of your name. That's usually how I like to do it. Got it. Okay, so when you sell it at sixty five cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. or you sell it subject to at eighty cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that let's say it's sixty five. Let's say the property is a hundred grand and a hundred grand. If you're going to sell it for 65, mm -hmm. that mortgage has to be under 65. Or is it a matter if it's over? So you're talking about selling it to an end buyer, a subject to deal? No, no, no. Like, let's say the seller, like, let's say the seller selling you the property. For 65? 
Correct, for 65. And, and they mm -hmm. don't want to take 65. They want to take the 80 on the subject two deal instead. Perfect, yep. Yeah. Okay. How, what's the difference in, in cash that they would be making with the 65 or the 80K is what I'm asking. So I would give I would give them the difference between my offer number and the mortgage. So if they owed 65 and I offer them 80, they get 15K at closing. That was the question right there. Okay. And if they don't, so so that's why- they But that's negotiable. It doesn't have to. I've given some sellers three grand because they just wanted to buy a used car and they were good with that. Got you know it. what I mean? So it, it doesn't have to be that, but when you say we make two offers, one cash, one on terms, and you throw out the higher number, you kind of got to live in that space. You can't just like yank it away from them. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Got it. Okay, cool. Okay. That, that cleared it up a lot because I, I in my head, I'm thinking it's got to be over what they owe in order for it to make sense. You can't yes. sell a property under what's owed or you're, you're losing money as the buyer. No, believe it or not, Center Street is underwater. Right now, that property is is probably worth eh, maybe not underwater. It was probably underwater when I bought it. It's actually it was underwater when I bought it. The seller owed last year uh, one twenty three or something like that. But the property was only worth like one fifteen or one twelve when I bought it. So I bought it knowing that the mortgage is more than what the current value was. But remember, Rafa, when we buy these deals on terms, we buy them for two different reasons, either for cash flow or equity. It had no equity in it, so it had to be the cash flow. So I'm putting out $12.5 um, uh, one time to close on a property, but it's yielding me $800 a month. I'm just looking at a measure of how long is it going to take me to get my twelve five back? You know what I mean? That was the whole play with that deal. So I buy deals underwater all the time. Dude, this is but they have to make sense with cash flow. Yeah. Wow. I love it, dude. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I could I was like, how? That doesn't make sense. The people need to make it now. You're you're saying basically you just take over the payments. It doesn't matter because the, the rent's higher than the mortgage. It doesn't matter. You're taking over the, the, the debt anyway. It's gonna get paid off over time, but you're making that cash flow. And you're not even the one paying the actual mortgage. It's the, the rent to own tenant. So you got it. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. So it's really just, it becomes, hey, <clears throat> when I'm making these offers to properties that are underwater, how long is it going to take me to recoup my initial outlay? And my thing is two years or less. I like to be in that pocket. I may go three years, but it's got to be a special property. Two years or less. I'm golden. Rafa, I put zero money into this property for repairs. The rent to own tenant did all the repairs to the interior. They moved their entire family in there. They maintained the, the property, interior, exterior, everything. I close, I back out. And, and I collected a $6,000 non-refundable deposit up front from the rent to own tenant. And first month's rent and security. So she ended up giving me, what is that? About eight, eight grand, nine grand. Jeez. So you I put out 12.5, yeah. but I got nine grand back from her up front. So you're technically going to be 100% out in five months. Probably, I'm done already, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ahead already. Months. <laughs> exactly. Wow. That's nuts, dude. That's insane, bro. Talk about creative. Okay. How does it work with um, the rent? It's still can't compete with your short term stuff, though. <laughs> it, that just threw the roof. Well, I mean, this is awesome, though, because you're getting it's property a, a technically for free. Like, you didn't have to put, look, it might actually compete with the short term rental because you're putting no money up front, right? You get it back right. in five months and yeah. you're still cash flowing $800 a month. Crazy, bro. Like, I just made a video on YouTube that says how to make $1,000 a month, and that requires at least 10 grand down just for furnishing cost. Yep. So this might actually be a pretty darn good deal, Sean. <laughs> like, it might actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this because you, you're $0 in yeah. at $800 yeah. a month. Like, I can't stress that enough. Like, $0 in, $800 a month, free cash flow, bro. Jeez. Oh, okay, how do you structure the deal with the rent-to-own Um tenant then oh like when does I the love, house actually become there so, yeah let's talk about that so one. i seven to ten years i don't do a two year some people like to be out two years three years my thing is i'm going to stretch this out as long as i can because two things will happen 
They have to give me the non-refundable deposit up front. And all of these months and years of $800 a month, I'm calculating that on the back end. And at the end, they have to buy it for a set price. Let's say I sold it to her for $155, right, in seven years. So I deduct $100 a month off the uh, monthly payment. The non-refundable deposit gets deducted, but she still has to come up with the difference. And then when she goes to a bank and gets a loan for this property, it will pay off the original mortgage, pay me off, then she gets the house. But I, that's the way I structure them. Non-refundable deposit up front, a monthly payment, which doesn't change, uh, believe it or not, You know, even though uh, things go up 2 3% a year, um, it doesn't change, it's fixed. And then um, you got to buy it at the end. So seven to 10 years, that's usually how I structure them. And if, what if they can't buy it because life situations happen and their credit went downhill and something like, what happens then? Then we go find another rent to own tenant <laughs> because they never take title. Right. They never go on title. They're just a tenant with the ability to purchase. So if they ever stop paying, I'm taking them to eviction court. I'm not, I don't have to foreclose on them. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what makes the deal so sweet. You have someone in one of your rentals treating it like it's theirs because they're an owner in training. You have two expenses, tax, well, three, taxes, insurance, mortgage, which they're all rolled into one payment anyway. Right. They pay you once a month. You pay the mortgage with that. No property management necessary. And, you know, you get to talk to guys like Rafa, man, during the, in the middle of your day. <laughs> <laughs> man, I'm telling you, this is probably one of the, like, the, I, I, I know I say this all the time, but, like, this is an awesome conversation. I love having these types of conversations. All right, Sean, okay, how often do you get pushback from these tenants, number one, for them? Like, because I would imagine that they don't want to move into a property that needs a ton of work, or am I right. just pre-assuming this? And second, how, how bad is the pushback when they comes to a point where they actually can't buy the property and you got to get them out. Um, so, so I've never, I've never experienced someone not being able to buy. I've, I haven't been doing it long enough to realize something uh, coming due and a tenant not being able to buy it. So I have, I'm, I've not gone through that yet, but as far as the original upfront, we may clean the property out. Right. If, if the seller was living in it, we may have it cleaned out from top to bottom. Now, I'm not saying repairs, just remove all the junk, broom swept. Right. So it's nice and they can see everything at the beginning. Right. So it really depends on the property. Some properties, the sellers leave it in a decent enough condition. But we don't really have to do anything to it. Right. Except the clean out. But if we do get a listen, clean and safe going in. So if, let's say, the doors don't lock, right? Or let's say there's a trip hazard somewhere in the house, right? Or let's say the plumbing is not working, right? Or something like that. Like, when we hand it over, it's got to be in a livable condition, right? We're not just giving them something that's just dilapidated, right? Because we want that five, that seven, that $8,000 non-refundable up front. Um, so when you ask about pushback, it varies, but we don't do no painting. We don't do no, you know, real work. We just set the stage for them and tell them, be as creative as you want. Hand me over this money. You can do whatever you want to do to the house. So we just make it like clean and safe for them going in. And I would imagine they love that too. Rarely, rarely. Because it's theirs. It's like, all of this is mine? Yes, have at it. Just pay me up front in the middle, and on the back end. You can have it. <laughs> That's it. That's yeah. it, man. And you, you you teach people how to do this, correct? Yes. So that's that's the other arm of our company. Um, I kept it Real Estate University. So that was really born from this these experiences, right, of bumping our head on subject to deals, um, not getting them right, uh, bumping our head on buy and hold deals, not getting them right, right, learning from them, flip deals, right? All of the experience, all of the things that we messed up and then corrected 
is what we teach on our platform at I Kept the Real Estate University. Yep. You know, I, I once went to one of these like weekend seminar retreats that I heard on the radio or something like that. <laughs> right. And was it free? So the first one was free. And then, they, you know, hey, you know, the next one's going to be the $50,000 to join this coaching program or whatever. I kid you not, the guy, dude, it's it's funny, Sean, listen to this. The, you <laughs> literally just gave the strategy that this guy was talking about teaching if you joined this $40,000 course. It's crazy, man. You just gave it away on this podcast for free. And I, 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 I literally, it came to my mind like literally 10 seconds ago. And I was like, wait a second. I've heard about this rent to own and it's crazy subject to rent to own deal before. And I was like, dude, nuts. So I appreciate you sharing that, man. This was this oh, was a absolutely, really cool conversation. Man. So we're, we're in the, we're in the part, Sean, where it's our segment, right? We're getting to the top of the hour here. Um, being that this is the big break show. Uh, we want to know what your big break in life was, whether it was a financial time, whether it was a certain strategy, whether it was a, a time in where your life changed. What was your big break that made you go from old Sean to new Sean, right? From regular Sean to investor Sean, from sad Sean to happy Sean, whatever the case may be. What was your big break? <laughs> oh, man, you know what? I remember it like like it was yesterday, man. Um, I was working with a company. Well, my wife and I, we just bought our, uh, our house here in New York. Uh, which we still live in. I mean, our house is old as dirt, man. I, I live in a hundred year old house, man. You can see it behind me. It's super old. Um, but I remember only having five grand left to my name, man. But I had good credit. We had no real savings because we just dumped the $21,000 that we've saved for the last decade into our primary residence, right? With an FHA uh, loan. But the big break for me was utilizing or leveraging my credit to the tune of $135,000 cash through credit card balance transfer checks. That, for me, understanding leverage, I was already in Milwaukee. That's where I was going. That start, that boost of capital is really responsible for everything that I've achieved in Milwaukee today, credit cards. So my big break was understanding that, hey, you don't have any cash or you can't do nothing with 5K, but you can turn your credit into cash to execute the strategy. That was my big break, man. And if it hadn't been for those eight credit cards, I probably wouldn't be sitting in front of you uh, today. God's honest truth, bro. Dude, I love that, man. You know what's funny, Sean? I started with 6K cash and a credit card, bro, in my business for the short-term rental side. You started with 5K cash and credit cards. Nuts, right? That's crazy. Man, I love it. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, bro. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so everybody listening, you know, make sure you take care of your credit, right, Sean? How important is credit? Literally everybody. <laughs> Man, it's, you know, I have a, a multi-million dollar portfolio in Milwaukee right now, man. You know, um, 74 units, uh, 43 properties from credit cards, right? If, if that doesn't tell you how important leverage and credit is, I don't know what else to say, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's crazy. That's it. It's crazy. Credit is everything, man. Yeah. It's everything. You know, and I wish they taught that more in school because like when I went to school, I, they didn't talk about credit. My kids, I have an 18 year old daughter. I, I talk to her about credit all the time. You know, I talk to her about how important it is. My younger kids, I'm sure you talk to your son about it. Like they got to make sure that they realize that credit is leverage in a lot of ways. Um, man, when my daughter was, my daughter's 18 now, but I, I started adding her to my credit cards as like an, as a, um, as a, what is it called? A beneficiary? Authorized or, user. Authorized user at 16. AU, absolutely. Yeah, so now she's 18 and she's got a freaking better credit score than I do. You know, <laughs> into it. So That's what you want though, man. Yeah. That's what you want. Yeah. Exactly. So now that's I, I taught her like, hey, this is what you got to do. And she's looking, you know what, man? She's actually looking to buy her first place. She's got like 35K saved up. I'm going to have her look in Milwaukee. Maybe you find a deal. Talk to me and I'll have my daughter. That'll be, that'll be her first investment at the age of 18. Awesome. Picking up her first place. Awesome, man. It's doable, bro. It's, it's definitely doable, man, without a doubt. But credit is credit is everything, man. And I and this is what I teach in the university, right? Um, I I just recorded something called the ten steps to buying or flipping or wholesaling your first deal, 
And this is step number one, because it was my step number one, right? Right. You know, I I didn't know anything about creative financing and none of that. When I was buying my first property, I bought my first one for twenty four nine. Man, you can look it up. Thirty five sixty two North Tenth Street, right? Twenty four thousand nine hundred bucks with credit card balance transfers. Yep, I've been rolling ever since, bro. <laughs> I that one. That's awesome, man. It's good to hear. Because again, I don't think enough people, I mean, people talk about credit, but it's like you have to like instill that into, especially like kids. Like, dude, when I was in my early 20s, I went to Target, bought a bunch of crap, didn't pay my credit cards. Like, I didn't actually fix my credit till I was in my 30s, man, like early 30s. Um, and I was just an idiot with, with credit cards. I didn't know. I didn't understand. And if I would have had that mindset or somebody telling talking to me about how important credit is at a very early age, like I would have probably had a different situation. I would have fast tracked where I'm at now, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and I think it's super important. So one of the other things, Sean, in our, in our, our, obviously the show is called The Big Break, but we have an actionable step that somebody could do right now after listening to this episode that they can take to make something happen, whether that's in real estate, with their credit, like what's something that somebody could take today that you can, you can give as an actionable step? So right now I would tell any new entrepreneur who wants to get into real estate, and this is a shameless plug for our platform. <laughs> But we have a free version of our platform. It's go to ikeptit10k.com, click on freemium. Here's the content I want that person to watch. Here's what I want you to watch. We have a video on how to use PropStream, how to use Mojo Dialer, free. It's an hour or 30 minutes or whatever, but it breaks down step by step how to find a motivated seller what uh, filters you need to put in, skip trace the motivated seller, that right there, that actionable step would be what I would tell anyone who's looking to get started. Because if you can be responsible for your own supply, the rest is history. You can fix your credit, you can get the capital, but if you know how to source those deals yourself and not be relying on MLS brokers and none of that stuff, you're 10 steps ahead already. So that would be the actionable step I would tell people to take. And uh, um, shoot us that link so that we can put it on the notes as well. After this, guys, we'll have it on the notes for you guys because this is awesome. Like, I mean, he's giving it to you guys for free. Go out go out and listen to it, right? Like, and watch it. So, yeah. Sean, how, how can people get a hold of you? Like, aside from the link we're about to post, like if I wanted to reach out to you and be like, yo, I want to learn from you. Yo, I just want to have a conversation with you. Yo, come on my podcast, whatever it is. Like, how can they get a hold of you? Right. So I'm definitely at a point where I only do what I want right now. <laughs> so I wanted to be here, Rafa. Um, so people can definitely reach out to uh, to me on Instagram. Uh, it's I kept it underscore real underscore estate. Um, or you can email my assistant, Cindy, at support at I kept it real estate LLC dot com. Those two ways or. You want to fast track if you want to get on the phone today. I still do free consultations. They're only 15 minutes, but come with your questions ready and we'll we'll bang them out. You can go to ikeptit10k.com and hit the tab that says consultation. And um yeah, we we can jump on a call today and start, you know, ironing out what direction in real estate uh, you would like to take. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's such good information to be able to talk to somebody like you for even if it's 15 minutes to kind of shape in the direction you need to get and then eventually either take your course or, you know, find the outline that works for you. And I think a lot of times and people that are starting off just don't know where to start. You know what I mean? They just don't know where to go, especially if they're going to be putting, you know, with, with this, what, what you're doing, you, you don't have to really use any much of capital at all, especially if you're going to sub to something or, you know, you don't have to have a ton of money or you can wholesale. That's a whole other ball game, which I'm sure you teach too. So, Um, Well, you know what, Jesse, the reason why I tell people to go out and watch that video, because that's the foundation for wholesale, a wholesale business. You have to know where to find the leads. So I'm giving people that entire business. Just you just have to execute it. And I give them step by step on how they get there. So great. Absolutely great points you you make. Definitely, man. 
Well, Sean, we appreciate you for being here. Everybody listening right now, please like and subscribe to this. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, please like this. Share this with somebody that you care about, That res if this resonates with you. Even if it doesn't resonate with you, but you have somebody that you know that's into real estate, please share, comment, like on our pages. That helps us grow our algorithm. And it also helps us grow to get to more people so Sean can help more people and we can connect all together. But Sean, man, I appreciate you for being here. And Rafa, do you got anything else, man? Nah, man, Sean, this was an awesome conversation bro i already knew it was gonna be a good conversation when you were like hey let's talk i was like bro yes let's talk <laughs> right know, I, I reached out to Rafa. Awesome. i said get me on this platform man <laughs> dude yeah and i'm so happy you came on bro i'm yeah, buying milwaukee now on, man dude. i appreciate you now you got me looking at me come on down come on down man come on down which reminds me sean i'm ready for a second one bro you guys can't <laughs> really deal. we'll talk we'll talk off the air <laughs> <laughs> all right brother thanks awesome, for being bro. here thanks man appreciate you man you guys take care take care brother Thank you.